So I, I want to start uh, making an in, in brief introduction about you. Uh, in fact, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Uh, Christian Lengauer is a prestigious researcher in the field of uh, parallel computing. He was a full professor at the University of Passau in Germany. And now he's uh, recently retired and he nicely accepted to give this talk to us. Uh, his interests are in parallel computing, optimization, and programming languages design and implementation, among many others. He was the chair of the steering committee of the Europar, Europar conference series. Uh, I first met him when we applied for organize this conference here in Santiago. Five years ago, we met him. Uh, his assistance and advisoring helped us a lot during that days in the organization uh, of this uh, conference with many uh, support and we appreciate his support a lot. Uh, in the future, we, we plan uh, another visit uh, here in the near future when the pandemic times are getting better. Uh, to give another talk about uh, some recommendations to succeed in the academic career that is mainly devoted for PhD, for our PhD students. But now uh, he's going to talk us about uh, an important question in parallel computing, that is how to identify and get advantage of the independency of different parts of a, go of a code that eventually can be optimized and uh, even executed in parallel. So I, I'm sure we are going to enjoy a lot your talk and uh, I, I think that uh, you can start when you want, Chris. Okay, so I'll start with first sharing my screen. Do you see my title slide? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So thanks very much for the introduction. It was good to see you too again, Francisco and Dora, even though it's long distance. I've been looking forward to this talk. I would have very much liked to come and give it in person in Santiago. I enjoyed Santiago very much when I was there twice in 2017. And I really do hope that the plans for my visiting again uh, when Corona subsides, uh, will uh, come uh, to pass. Uh, today, I'm talking about semantic independence, and I want to start a bit unconventionally, namely with reading material. And the main reason for doing so is to give credit to my collaborators. Also, it gives me the uh, opportunity to advertise an encyclopedia of parallel computing that appeared nine years ago under the chief editing of, of David Padua, uh, with more than 300 entries on topics of parallel computing. And what distinguishes it from other collections is that many of the entries were authored by central players in the field, and the whole thing was rigidly uh, revised. So I think it's a collection of particular quality. And uh, I would like to uh, draw your attention to two entries uh, pertaining to this talk. The main entry is the one about semantic independence authored by Martin Frenzel and myself. And another one is about the polyhedron model, which is one of the main playing grounds has been for me and my research group. And there is a connection to the topic of semantic independence that if I have time, I will allude to at the very end of the talk. The seminal paper on semantic independence is 30 years old. It's by Eike Best and myself. It was instigated uh, by Eike Best. And uh, it seems curious maybe to some of you that I am speaking about an issue that was basically resolved at that time. Uh, there are two reasons for it. The first one is it's a wonderful example of rigorous foundational 
science of programming. It is very self-contained. You can understand it in its entirety without a lot of previous knowledge. And those are the reasons why I thought it's, it's, it's the best topic for this talk. I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of noise on my speakers from, from your side. Okay, that's better. Um, so let's start with a few introductory remarks. The setting is one familiar to most of you, namely imperative sequential programs. So the kind of programs that, that we write and look at every day. And the question is, when are two assignment statements, I restrict myself to singular assignment statements, uh, independent of each other? That is, when do they have absolutely nothing to do with each other? And that's an issue of program analysis, and it's quite important to at least two areas of uh, uh, computer science, namely uh, high performance computing and databases. Um, what we would like, there have been uh, criteria for independence that are syntactically grounded, so they are oriented at the syntactic appearance, at the textual appearance of the source program. We want to get away from that and go to a semantic model, program model, independent of the program code. That is usually the first step that you do if you want to do a serious program analysis or optimization, and that hadn't been done before for uh, independence. One criterion of soundness is that uh, semantic independence should, of course, imply commutativity. So if two statements are independent, they should you should be able to uh, apply them sequentially in either order. The opposite should, of course, not be true. But independent statements should be executable disjointly in parallel. That is a very strict requirement. So you should basically be able to put one of these statements on one platform, computation platform, one on another, and execute them and get the combined result without the two knowing of each other or having any contact with each other. What are the benefits? There are two major benefits. One is in data security, namely if you have this disjoint parallelism, then you can separate the namespaces and implicitly have a firewall between these two platforms and data security in this respect. But another main issue is, of course, the uh, acceleration of program execution by being able to execute these uh, statements in parallel. Okay, so how do we get to such a semantic criterion? We start by looking at a few pairs of statements and wondering whether they should be independent. And after that, we can see whether we find a criterion that makes them independent. So that, let's start to look at a few examples. They'll be enumerated. Here's example one. I always name the two assignment statements with alpha one and alpha two. So here we have two statements, one increases X, the other one decreases Y. And the question is whether these two statements should be independent. Yes, they should be independent. That's called uh, <laughs> trivial independence, essentially, because their namespaces are disjoint. You know, alpha one only works on X, alpha two only works on Y. There's no reason why these shouldn't be independent. Let's get a little more involved by looking at shared reading. Now both statements assign a value of a shared variable to an own private variable. The shared variable is set, the private variables are X and Y. So this is the basic issue of shared reading. Should there be independence? Well, I'm going now to the expectations of implementers. And if we would not permit this kind of statement to be independent, then high performance computing would be in a bad state. Architectures support shared reading without disturbance, most architectures. 
And so uh, we are in, in a shared memory architecture, we are basically expected to make this happen in parallel if possible. And so independence should be permitted here. Our criterion should permit this as independent. Next, we look at two statements. One increases x by one, one increases x by two. Well, this example three, how does it uh, differ from example one? Both statements use the same variable. Now, if you have experience in parallel computing, you will realize that there's a problem here. That's the so-called shared update problem. There are two assignments to the same variable, and there are two separate computations on the same variable, and there's going to be a problem. And this problem I want to go briefly through with you on the following slide. The shared update problem, I'll color the two statements. x equals x plus 1 is red. x equals x plus 2 is blue. On the architecture, these are being refined to four statements, two evaluations of the right-hand sides and two assignments of the left-hand sides. I again color the four statements as to which one of the assignments they belong. Now, these four statements have the uh, fortunate property that each one of them refers to the space of common variables and the space only contains x. x is the only common variable, not more than once. Here is x touched once, here is x touched once, here is x touched once, here is x touched once. And if that is the case, then you can consider this effect on the joint variable space as atomic, and that is safe. Yeah, that's called safe. So each of these four assignments is safe, but in a parallel execution, since, since these are considered atomic, you can just identify the parallel execution with an interleaving of these four assignments, you unfortunately get interference. Here are the six possibilities of interleaving these four assignments. You know, the, so the rule is that the two assignments in red have to maintain their order, the two assignments in blue have to maintain their order, but otherwise the order is arbitrary. So there are six cases and you see you get different responses, different results. This is really interesting. Try if you have a multi-core laptop, you can try this on longer computations and you will see how that with every parallel execution you get a different result. So that's of course not good. X equals X plus one and X equals X plus two can be commuted, so executed in either order, but they cannot be executed in parallel. So let's go back to our list of examples. This should not uh, satisfy, this pair of statements should not satisfy our criterion of independence. Okay, a fourth example that is rather complex. And these examples, there are two more examples, this one and the fifth example, and they are of course crafted in order to make specific points about the character of semantic independence. So what have I done here? I have for one restricted the type of the variable, the value range of the variables to just four rather than to an infinite uh, number of possible values. And the reason for that is that I can show you the computational model, the semantic model for these two uh, assignments on one slide. Okay, so that's why we are now with, with variables that have a very limited range. In this case, they have four values as range. And then I use an arbitrary com uh, computation that of course needs to stay within this range. That's why we have the mod operations here. And that makes a lot of uh, touches of the common variable space. The common variable space here is X and Y. One uh, assignment assigns to X, the other one assigns to Y, but both assignments read X and Y. So if you have an informal experience, you would not expect this 
to be independent. And uh, you will see in the slide after next a syntactic criterion that in fact fails here for independence. A very classical syntactic criterion. But first, I want to show you that these should be independent, surprisingly. And I'll show you that on the coming slide where I go to the semantic model now. So for now, we have just looked at program code in order to analyze whether things are independent or not. But as I told you, that's not the good idea. The best idea is to go to a semantic model and that's the model of state changes. So I'll show you these two variables now and what alpha one and alpha do to do to the values of these two variables in this very coming slide. So the variables are both two bit variables because they can take on four values. And here you see the uh, state transformations. What alpha one does is it copies bit zero of y to bit one of x and alpha two, two copies bit zero of, of x to bit one of y. Um, if you look at these variables x and y as unbreakable sort of, then you have dependence. But you can imagine that you take a cleaver and you cut off the connection here and rather than two four bit variables you use four two bit variables and then you can put these two bits bit one of x and bit zero of y into one namespace and bit zero of x and bit one of y into the other namespace and then you have this joint parallelism then you have the uh, this uh, the trivial form of independence the programs look like this. Here are the four variables that are now binary only and not four valued. Here are the two assignments that these arrows signify. And this program has the same meaning, semantically equivalent to the program on the page before with two variables that are four valued. And that the two have the same semantics can be made specific formally by providing correspondences between the values of the variables of one program and the variables of the other program. So these four variables are have the values like this in terms of the two variables x and y and vice versa x has this value in terms of x1 and x0 and y uh, similarly of y1 and y0. So here lies the basic idea of our criterion for semantic independence. What we need to do if we don't see it syntactically is we need to transform the variable space. And I, I also call this a coordinate transformation. If you consider the coordinates, the variables of the program, you need to find a different collection of variables and accordingly different computations that are equivalent to the original program. And our semantic criteria, uh, criterion for semantic independence needs to fix this correspondence and this uh, coordinate transformation. Now let's come back to the syntactic criteria that have been around for a long time. They have been invented by Alan Bernstein in 1966, mainly for use in databases at that time. They're called the Bernstein conditions. They deal with a little, or I'll make them deal here with a little more general form of uh, assignment so that we can write a bit more complicated programs, namely a multiple assignment. So we allow ourselves to have several target variables that get the values of several expressions. And the semantics then is that you evaluate these expressions all first and then assign them to these variables. Uh, one prerequisite that you have in this kind of semantic uh, world always is that expressions need to be side effect free. That is in the evaluation of an expression, you're not allowed to change the value of a variable. Yeah, you can only change the value of a variable by an explicit assignment. So then there are two basic and very easy to follow 
conditions, Bernstein conditions, namely the strong Bernstein conditions, says that the two assignments alpha one and alpha two share no variables at all. So that is the trivial kind of independence. That is the strong Bernstein condition. The weak Bernstein condition says they can share the namespace of the right-hand sides, but not the namespace of the left-hand sides. Uh, when you, when you, uh, when you uh, uh, formulate this explicitly, that means that the variables that are targets of alpha one do not appear anywhere in alpha two and vice versa. The variables that are targets of alpha two do not appear anywhere in alpha one. So that is what we consider the allowance of shared reading. Okay. Now let's review our examples. Example one, that are, oh, first of all, a few remarks about the Bernstein conditions. Of course, the strong Bernstein conditions, uh, condition applies the weak Bernstein condition. Now, the strong Bernstein condition permits disjoint parallelism, trivial independence, as I said. The weak Bernstein condition prevents the shared update problem. So it is shared reading only, essentially. Example one, that was the first trivial example, satisfies the strong Bernstein condition. Example two, with shared reading, satisfies the weak Bernstein condition. Example three, that was x plus one and x plus two, uh, vi violates both Bernstein conditions. And example four also violates both Bernstein conditions, but we found a coordinate transformation that satisfies the strong Bernstein condition. So now in order to exploit the potential for independence that is not covered by these syntactic criteria of Bernstein, we need to make general this coordinate transformation that makes example four succeed, where with Bernstein it fails. And in order to do that, I uh, give you another example that we'll look at more closely and on which I will uh, illustrate how uh, this criterion uh, uh, is formulated. So here it says already this is even worse, namely it is two statements again that have now a shared target variable space even. In example four we didn't have that, we only had the shared space of the variables read here and maybe written of one of them, but here both of them write to both variables and both of them read both variables. So with Bernstein, strong or weak, this goes up in flames. We have three variables with binary values, two values each. So these are eight program states, eight possible combinations of values of X, Y, and Z. And what I'm doing now is I'm showing you the semantic model, just as I did before, it's this very simple example with only two variables. I'm showing you, the, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I'm, I'm giving you a preview and telling you that this should be also independent. Namely, we can make a coordinate transformation that reduces this complex computation to alternative erasing of one or the other variable. And one thing that's complicating things here seemingly is that if Z takes on the value zero, we have one set of assignments that are now independent by strong Bernstein. If Z has a value one, we have another set of assignments. Yeah. Now, how do you get to this? Well, you look sharply at it. That is our way with which we discovered that this is a coordinate transformation that makes these two statements independent. And the complicating factor with, example, uh, with respect to example four is that it is conditional. It depends on the condition of Z, what the variable, uh, what the coordinate transformation should look like. So that's rather complex, but it exposes independence. So our criterion for independence should also cover two statements. And that's the most complex situation that uh, I will do to you. And now I did what I just wanted to do a minute before, namely I'll show you the semantic model of this 
this pair of programs. Here it is. Now you again see states. Now before you saw two two-bit variables, we have now a three-bit variable. Yeah, I combine x, y, and z, and here the three values. This is the state in which x is zero, y is zero, and z z is zero. That's the state in which x is one, y is zero, and z is zero, and so on and so forth. And then I have the state transformations. So if at the at the uh, the source of an arrow is the pre-state of the assignment. At the tip of an arrow is the post-state of the assignment. And because there are so many arrows, I do something I didn't do in the, in the, in the picture before. Namely, I make the arrows of assignment alpha 2 dashed and the arrows of assignment 1 solid. So we have a number of solid arrows that reflect state changes at alpha 1 effects and uh, dashed arrows for alpha 2. And now this is our, uh, our world in which we are trying to expose independence, this the stage transition graph. Okay, now the question is, what is the property of this graph? What properties does this graph have that allows us to formulate two independent assignments? And I'm just giving you that, yeah, by showing you how a coordinate transformation can be fixed formally. What I do is I partition this state space in two ways. One partition, one partitioning is consists four elements of, of two spa uh, states each. These are the uh, rectangles here. And the other partitioning contains two partitions of four spaces each, four states each. Now, why these two partitions? Because in the first partition, the first partition captures all the state changes of alpha one. Namely, you see all solid arrows remain within one partition. There are no solid arrows that connect two of these partitions. And vice versa, the two partitions of, uh, uh, of the second partitioning capture all the dashed arrows. There are only dashed arrows within one partition and no dashed arrows between the two partitions. And that's essentially the, the criterion. We have to find two partitionings that are orthogonal in that sense. One captures the state changes of one of the statements, the other one captures the state spaces of the other partitioning. So here you have the two, uh, the two uh, uh, requirements. You need two orthogonal part uh, partitionings, row one and row two and the capturings uh, mutually of uh, the state changes of alpha one and alpha two. Now, once you have these two partitionings, you can uh, gel them into two target variables. And that is also depicted in this picture here. The one partitioning that only has two partitions reflects a variable that I call V. Yeah? And one of these partitions reflects the value of v being zero, the other one, the one of v being one. So that's, since there are two partitions in this partitioning, there is a two-valued variable. The other partitioning generates a four-valued variable, w. Yeah, and here the va values are being noted here, w equals zero, one, two, and three. So we've been successful in making this requirement happen and satisfying this requirement. And we thought that is all you need in order to uh, formulate independence. And then some very uh, acute uh, readers and, 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 and uh, colleagues who read our work discovered that we missed this tiny little further requirement and to which I will come later. Yeah. But what I want to do now is after having given you an informal impression of 
what the requirements on a state graph a transformation graph are in order to expose independence. I want to make this formal. And these are two, what follows are two slides of formulas now in algebra, universal algebra, that I will talk you through. I don't expect you, if you're not at home in, in, in algebraic uh, mathematics, uh, to follow this to the T, but I, I want to demonstrate to you that this is all formally nailed down, nailed down and not in any respect windy. So here's the algebraic semantic model. You don't need much previ previous knowledge about this. You need to understand what a mathematical relation is. I, I, I hope you do. A relation is a subset of uh, the cross product of two spaces and we have a relation on one state space. So it's a relation between elements of a, a state space and itself. These two relations, they represent the effects of our two assignments. Yeah, that is the standard semantic model of imperative computation is, is relational. Then we need a function that I call eta that uh, that uh, nails down this uh, this transformation of the state space. So the state space X with our variables of the source program is transformed into a state space Y with our different variables of the target program. And in Y, we need to have the criterion for independence. That is, the variables in Y need to be splittable into one side, one set of variables that is only addressed by one of the assignments in the target program, the other side only by variables of uh, the other assignment in the target program. And then we need two target computations. Yeah, these are the, the assignments on the target variables. I call them uh, R prime and S prime. And they, of course, are now relations on Y on the target space. And here, this may seem a little complicated to you because it uses the relational product. I'll give you the relational product afterwards. But essentially what this says is R prime works on Y, but only on the A part of Y. And the part of R prime that works on the A part of Y is called little r. On the B part of Y, R prime does nothing. And this refers to the identity on the B part. Uh, yeah, mutually, S prime works only on the B part of Y, and that is called S, and leaves the A part of Y alone. So the, the relations that really uh, characterize the computations are little r on A and little s on B. So for reference, here's the relational product. It, it just pairs two relations. You know, here's a relation R with a pair input output. Here's a relation S with a pair input output. And you just pair the inputs and the outputs. And the other operation that you need is the concatenation, the composition of relations. It's just one relation and after that another relation. And you go over a, an intermediary value, you know, that is the output the target of the first relation and is then the source of the second relation. So if you are familiar with relational algebra, this is the absolute minimum that you can deal with. And now I formulate the criteria, first the criterion that I've already illustrated informally on the slide before within this framework, it will look very simple. And then the criteria that we missed and other colleagues pointed out to us. So our criterion is very simple. If you compute on the source space with the respective, with the appropriate computation R, and then move over to the target space, that should have the same effect or should be the same equality as if you go right to the target space and compute in the target space. And that's the same for both assignments, the assignment R and the assignment S. And the requirement that we missed is that eta 
may not incur any information loss. So if you compute in the source space, that should be identical to going to the target space, computing there, and then coming back. So the thing that we did formulate is that eta minus one may not lose any information. Yeah, and the same for S. Compute in the source space, that's the same as going to the target space, uh, uh, computing there and going back. Now, these are the formulas, but it's much easier to comprehend. And as I, as I said, I repeat, th th this slide and the slide before are there for your reference to have the complete formalism. What will make you understand what's going on is the picture that follows now. You have the source space before the computation and the source space after the computation. And you have the relation R, the first assignment, that transforms the source space. Then you have the target space that is split into two parts, but R only works on A, little r. Yeah? On B, it is the identity. And now the two requirements are that this diagram commutes in two ways, namely computing on the source side and going over to the target side is the same as computing on the target side, uh, going over to the target side and computing there. These two red arrows reflect requirement one. And computing on the source side is the same as going to the target side, computing there, and coming back. So the green arrows reflect, re illustrate requirement two. So this is the uh, postulation for R, the first assignment. And for B, for S, which is that S in the target space computes on the other partition, on the other part of the state space and leaves this is the part A alone. So that's the illustration of the requirement. Now I uh, summarize and give you the formal definition again, which is essentially uh, for completion for you, you know, that you have the complete situation. You can combine both requirements by into this one requirement yeah, for R and for us. Yes. And then we can formulate the definition of semantic independence as follows. I'll read it through. Two relations R and S on state space X are semantically independent. If they are non-trivial, it's necessary that your state spaces are uh, uh, have more than one element. Sets A and B, relations little r on A and little s on B, and a coordinate transformation function eta of x to a cross b, such that these equations hold. Now, what's different from the is from the slide before, from the formulas you've seen before? I've thrown out all the names that are primed. I don't have r prime, and I don't have s prime. I also don't have y, but I replaced where they belong with the expressions that, uh, by which they are defined. Yeah, so, so this way you are only formulating things in terms of elements of the source program, R and S, and of eta. And the remark is that uh, I think that was clear before that you see this from the picture, little r simulates big R on A and little s simulates big S on B, and that's expounded by these equations. I think the thing that I would like to take home for you is this picture, because this tells it all. And the rest around it tells you that it's all formally uh, nailed down. OK, now we have the formal, define, uh, formal for, uh, definition of independence. Now let's see whether it satisfies commutativity. It implies commutativity. And that is wonderfully simple in uh, universal algebra. Namely, you just need to formulate a, or, pr or prove a sequence of equations. Yeah. R followed by S is the same as S followed by R. Exploiting independence. Yeah, so the, pre uh, the, uh, the assumption is that R and S are independent. And by this equation, 
a sequence, you uh, can prove that they are commutative. The opposite is not true. Commutativity does not imply independence. And one counterexample you have seen is x equals x plus 1 and x equals x plus 2. You cannot find a separation. Uh, and, uh, you cannot find a partitioning, two orthogonal partitionings of the state space of this program in order uh, to assert independence. Example five formally, I, I want to show you the target program and what ETA looks like, but uh, it's only for for inspection for you. I, I don't expect you to follow this through completely. We have already seen that. We have seen the source program and we have seen the, uh, the, the state transformation space with its two orthogonal partitionings. Here is eta with S, which works only on A, and R, which works only on B. And from that, to synthesize the target program is very simple because one what, uh, assigns to the va variable v and the other one assigns to the variable w and here's your transform program. So yeah, as, as the state space says, you have uh, v has only two values, zero and one, w has four values, and here are the according assignments uh, that uh, give you these straight tra state transformations here. Okay, and that's the end of our illustrations and of our formal definitions. And to me, what comes now is the slide that is most interesting in this whole affair. And this is some observations that can be made. And that's, that's the stuff that surprised me and still makes me curious in some sense. So I would say it's a philosophical content of, of this talk. The first one is that uh, I don't know if maybe one or the other of you noticed this, that we made seemingly contradiction, uh, contradicting requirements here. The, namely, we postulated that shared readings should be possible, but we also postulated disjoint parallelism. Now, is that not a contradiction in terms? Because if you share reading, you can't be disjoint. But the requirement, uh, the, the uh, criterion that we formulated tells us that even if we have shared reading, we should be able to separate two assignments out that don't share any of their source at all. And that's what we get. Yeah. Both the joint writing of X and of Y and also the joint reading of Z disappear in the transformation in example five, and then in other, other transformations are there are all other examples also. There is in the target program definitely never any sharing at all, even if the source program performs shared reading. However, if you transit via eta or via eta minus one, that may incur shared reading. So what does that tell us? It tells us that shared reading is a matter of convenience, not as a necessity. I call it semantic sugar. If you know the term of syntactic sugar, syntactic sugar is syntax that is convenient for you, but not strictly necessary. Shared reading is convenient for the formulation of your program, but not strictly necessary. That's very curious. So that means that our second example, x equals z and y equals z, should also have a target program that is completely disjointly parallel. And I'll show you this program now, except that I make one little change again, namely in the original example, I made x and y integer variables. And now I'm making them binary variables so that you have a smaller state space again, okay? So on the left hand side, you see the source program. On the right hand side, you see the target program. I'm not developing this for you. I'm just throwing it at you. Yeah. Now, a few little things to point out. You have again an eight valued state space because you have three uh, binary variables in the source program. And you have again 
one binary variable and one four-valued variable. And, and this is really strange now, the target program of this simple program looks almost like the one of the complex two uh, assignments in example five. The only difference is that here you have a three rather than a two. Now, what that means, I can tell you, and nobody else so far could, could tell me either. Yeah. It's just curious at, the, at present. Um, another observation is that the previous program of example five, the target program, is not load balanced as this one is not load balanced. Now, the program for example five was having a two here. So alpha two does computation, but alpha one does not. That is not load balanced. That's not nice. So what is that telling you? Well, that the semantic independence criterion doesn't necessarily give you nice load balance parallelism. What it gives you is uncompromisingly disjoint namespaces. Yeah. We have another target program. It's way back on slide five. That is load balanced. And if you remember, that was the program which had a different set of variables or a different set of assignments for the value z equals zero and for the value z equals one. This program is load balanced, but it doesn't fall out of our independence criterion. Why not? Because it is conditional. The alternative program on slide nine, it was, is load balanced, but it is based on the conditional partitioning. Now you can, of course, apply the independence criterion also by uh, pro proposing conditional partitionings. Yeah, but you don't need to. You, you, in this case, you don't need to. In, in, in the case of example five, we have one partitioning, one target program that is not conditional, another one that is conditional. So that's all very strange. Concluding remarks, both Bernstein conditions imply semantic independence. That is, is a very important statement because Bernstein conditions are very, very popular, have been popular for uh, half a century. Semantic independence implies the strong Bernstein condition and thus disjoint implementability. Semantic independence implies commutativity. Commutativity does not imply semantic independence. We have all uh, proved all this. So decidability, of course, there is no general decision procedure for semantic independence. I never expect there to be one. It's, uh, it's in my intuition, much too general a problem. Yeah. You have to think about it, but there are, the, if you restrict the application domain, then you may be able to find such criteria such 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 uh, uh, computable criteria or general or, or decision procedures and one uh, one uh, domain in which i've been working for several decades close to three decades is that of automatic loop parallelization in which you have a decision procedure that exposes parallelism. Not only that, it exposes optimal parallelism with respect to some ob objective function that you give it. And that is the polyhedron model. I told you at the start that I wanted to come to this. So I will close with uh, a few remarks about it and then a small characterization of it. Now, the polyhedron model of the loop parallelization works on a different semantic model, not on a state transition graph, but on an iteration graph. But it offers a decision procedure. And this procedure is an algorithm for a search of an optimal space-time mapping. So not only any, any distribution in time and space of the steps of the loop nest, but an optimal mapping. You can this. You can see that this is a coordinate transformation. That's why I call uh, the variable change in in general also a coordinate transformation because it's akin to what happens in the polyhedron model. So let me show you, and that is my final slide. Uh, in one slide, how the polyhedron model works. You have a loop nest, 
of not necessarily uh, perfectly nested loops. Here you have two, uh, two loops inside each other and one statement inside both loops, one statement only inside the outer loop. You go to a semantic model. As I say, it's not the state graph model, it's the iteration graph model. And you find all the iteration steps of this statement inside both loops and all the steps of this statement inside the outer loop. You find the dependencies between them by a dependence graph generation. And then this magic happens, this decision procedure is based on integer linear programming that does a coordinate shift. You know, in the program, you have loop variables i and j with the coordinates i and j in the iteration graph. i iterates across horizontally, j iterates across vertically. And you do a coordinate transformation, you get new variables, T for time and P for processes. The processes iterate in space, T iterates in time. And you can arrange all the computations after the coordinate transformation such that you don't have to evaluate each of these iterations in sequence but you only go along here in time and everything that stacks on top operate, uh, to, happens in parallel. So these four steps happen in parallel after these three steps and so on and so forth. Okay. Now this, this model has been uh, quite uh, popular for a number of decades, at least until the 90s and has found its way also in some uh, production compilers. And it's, it's, it's the same, at least it's, it's the same spirit as the independence criterion that I showed you just in general. So my final uh, lesson here is essentially that if you want to explore independence in general, you make a number of philosophical observations, but you definitely don't get the computational procedure. You also may not get load balancing or other practical uh, 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 properties that you would like to have. If you restrict the domain, then you can get a lot more practicality as the polyhedron model shows you. Okay, with that, I'm finished. Let me look at my watch. Um, 50 minutes. So I guess that's what I hope to accomplish. And I hope that you all stuck with me. It's very strange not to have any feedback or response from you, but maybe I'll get some responses now. Yes, thank you very much, Chris. You can hear all the applauses because people is not connected uh, their microphones, but for sure, uh, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Now I think that uh, uh, we have some time for, for questions or comments. Uh, maybe you can talk or uh, use the, the chat in the Teams uh, uh, platform. I don't know how to use that, so... Um... You will have to relay questions to me. Any question or comment, please? I have one question. Yeah. Uh, you said that uh, you have a small number of people in the group. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. okay. So, first of all, thank you very much for this very nice presentation. Uh, although I'm not very familiar with the topic, I still think it's very interesting and I would like to ask some question, maybe it's a little bit naive. Uh, so if I understood correctly, you mentioned that there is no uh, automatic procedure to achieve in general this semantic independence. Is this right? right? Yes? Yes, that's right. So uh, are there at least any hope of some guidelines or general criteria that will help a developer obtaining this semantic independence or uh, does it need to be, let's say, done case by case on a particular no, no. case? No, no, I mean, uh, the, the way to go in this is in general, one lesson we've learned in the last few decades 
by the area of domain specific programming is that if you narrow your domain, you can do a lot more automatic automatically than on a wide domain. So as another example, a general per a compiler for a general purpose language like Java or Fortran or whatever can have much lower power in program optimization than a domain specific compiler. It goes to the, 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 the Chris, Chris, yes. Chris, sorry, uh, the sound is very bad. Uh, the sound is bad. Yeah. Really? Oh. Could you could you speak closer to the to the microphone or try maybe, to? Maybe I think I was too close, or it is because microphones are open on both sides. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the problem. Maybe if you close, because at the start of the talk, we, I had a lot of noise too. So I'll, I'll start again. It's, I hear no noise from you. Sometimes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So the idea is to narrow the application domain. If you, if for a general, the, the more general you make uh, your problem, the less analysis power, automatic analysis power you will have. Yeah. So you see this already in, in logic. It, if, if you make your logic formulas more and more powerful, you lose more and more in, 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 in your computational uh, ability. Yeah. Um, so one example I was saying is the whole idea of domain-specific programming, where you restrict your programming language to a particular domain rather than keeping a general purpose. And then, give the compiler knowledge about this domain in order to optimize your program better or map it better to a particular architecture. The same here, you know, the general, if you allow general assignment statements and want to find out their independence, then you have very little opportunity of doing this automatically because you don't know enough about the context of these assignments. When you narrow your domain, for instance, in the in the loop model, then uh, because the, the polyhedron model does not allow any loopness, it cannot analyze any arbitrary loopness. There need to be restrictions. Lots of these, and I don't want to go into this. It's all into in, in, in the entry uh, in the encyclopedia. But the main restriction that happens at many places in this model is that. Expressions have to be linearly affine. They have to be linear expressions. As you see here, these are all affinely linear expressions. There are no higher terms, no quadratic terms in there or, or cubic terms. And because of these restrictions, we get the computational power of integer linear programming to do all this magic for us. If we give up this restriction, this all falls down. So, so that's the idea. I can't. You don't need to go, go program by program. You need to find out what the domain is in which you have a theory that gives you better computational power. Hey, Chris, there is a, a couple of questions from Alberto in the chat. I don't know if you can read it or. Uh, no, I don't. I, I let me see. Then I'll, I'll have to see whether I can. And go to the no, I can't because I, I don't have the I, I can't read it for you. The first one is uh, which book about polyhedron model uh, would you recommend? Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> I don't I don't think there's a book on the polyhedron model, but uh, I go to the entry, go to the entry of uh, my encyclopedia, the encyclopedia entry that's been written by me, who is, uh, you know, I said, we are the ones who are pushing the boundary, and by Paul Fortrier, who, who has been the major proponent of, of the classical theory. It's a 14-page uh, paper. That's a good way to start, and it has a lot of references, and uh, he can go from there. Well, the, uh, maybe Alberto can, can read his uh, second question directly. Do you hear me or? I hear you, yes. 
Okay, so I was wondering about uh, when you use uh, graph models uh, to to deal with dependencies. Uh, does it make sense since graph models are considered as uh, CDW complex uh, with used vertices as zero cells and edges as one cells to expand it to further dimensions and use uh, higher dimensions uh, CW complex to modelize dependencies? Yeah, it does. That's that's what happens in the polyhedral model. One problem there is that you quickly explode in the number of dimensions if you if you do tiling and, and, and stuff like that. So that definitely makes sense. By the way, I want to offer you to send you this entry if that's easier for you. Uh, uh, I can mail you the PDF of the polyhedron model entry. I don't know if uh, there is any other question. Well, I think that uh, we can finish here. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, for your nice talk. Uh, I hope we can meet in a few weeks or months here in Santiago. Yeah. And uh, I hope uh, we can uh, pass these bad times with the pandemic and, and see you here soon. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's see how this develops. It's interesting times. Thanks for the invitation. I enjoyed it. Okay, we'll be in touch by email uh, for for the next talk and for finishing the some administrative issues okay. about this one. Okay? okay, thank you very much. Thank you okay. everyone. Okay. For thank you, Chris. Talk. Thank you. Good luck. Bye bye. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Chris.